Yes. Thank you, girls. What else can I say apart from thank you, thank you, thank you for being part of this panel discussion with two amazing artists in the art world, one an artist and the other one photographer. And the subject today was art in social movements. Why? Because we thought you girls bring the ugly into beauty. So we wanted to address the fact that in the world there are some social issues and we don't know how, you need to explain to us how you do it, how can you turn a conflict or a problem or an issue into beautiful art that makes us emotional in a way, the tone of our heart is already, you know, um, we turn into empathy and your art turns into compassionate art. So I would like to introduce two, 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 two of our panelists, uh, behind is the audience, the first uh, panelist today is Helen, Helen Sukhaib. She was born in Lebanon and now she lives in Washington, DC. The second panelist is Donna, photographer, living between uh, Zurich and Vancouver, right, Donna? That's right. And she is um, a climate uh, reality leader. And Helen, is. Um, she addresses the issues of the Arab and the American cultures. So Helen, can we start with you? Mm, sure. I know you're going to present your work, but first of all, I would like to ask you what motivated you to become an artist? Oh, wow. How many, how many minutes and hours do we have for that question? <laughs> um, first of all, I want to thank you very much, Maria, for getting us together with this incredible photographer, Donna. I'm so excited to get to know you here. And it's an honor for me to be speaking with you. And also thank you to the participants who are joining us today. I'm talking to you from Washington, DC, as Maria said. I am a full-time painter. I grew up primarily in the Middle East um, and Europe. And um, I have been evacuated from a few different wars and coups, attempted coups, which we had in our own country here uh, about a month ago. Um, and so after I came to America to study art and living in Washington, DC, and being an Arab American, it's, a, it's like a, a feeling that I have of a connection, partly of nostalgia, because I couldn't go home because of the war, and partly because I wanted to tell our story. I don't want other people to tell our story, you know, especially after, say, 9-11 mm -hmm. in America, when we had a lot of negative um, stereotyping and against Arabs, against Arab Americans, against Muslims. It, it became important for me to express from our point of view uh, what we were feeling, what we wanted to be known for, and, and to dispel some of those stereotypes. So um, I have continued to work on that platform to create a dialogue, to mm -hmm. open lines, as you said in, our, in your opening statement, to create a, a feeling of like empathy that I would like people to pay attention to. Um, just as Donna, I suspect, wants to create uh, empathy and compassion for our world and the animals that are living on there. Um, it's the same for me. So for me, I think, I, I, I hope not to be preachy. I, I don't want to tell somebody what to think, but I hope to show them mm -hmm. through my work and through a visual journey of another way of thinking or looking at someone else's uh, life, stepping into someone else's shoes and, and creating that empathy and understanding. That's, that's a long answer, but. Um, but, but what motivated you? Because I, I can imagine you've been growing up with, with conflict and, and social issues. Yeah. So what motivated yeah. you to speak about exactly migration and the Arab ladies? Okay. So when I, 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 I didn't get to go home, when I left Lebanon, we left my father there when we were evacuated. We evacuated to Greece. And then I finished my school in Paris. When I left and I left my father, I remember like yesterday, I said, daddy, when are we gonna come home? We left with nothing. It was a curfew, we ran from our place. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very 
not a good time. And he said, you'll be back in a week. My week turned to 35 years that I'm coming back. When I came back, I did a big show in Lebanon. I went to Syria to see where my father was born. My father was born in Damascus and Jordan. When I came back to America, the quote unquote Arab spring, Arab uprisings, the revolutions began. Mm -hmm. So as an artist, my only voice is through my paintings. I wish I was, you know, I could change the world with a magic wand. But the only voice I know what I can do, I, I began this visual journey through the Arab Spring that begins till, till, you know, till today. It's now 10 years I've been working on this particular subject. Can, and we, the see, can we see some, Helen? Can, 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 you show, can you show the audience a little bit Absolutely. of your, because it reflects so much of your past that is still present with you, right? Yes. Um, absolutely. Um, what I'm showing here, um, sorry, uh, this is the Capitol building. Oh, what? Can you guys see that? Not yet. Uh, no. Not yet? Not no. yet, but we will soon. You will soon? Yes. Okay. Yeah, now. You, you can't, is it large? Not yet. No. No. Not yet. Okay. Yes. yes, I see. Okay, yes. And, 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 and please, audience, uh, Maria is going to take your questions, so please feel free to interrupt. I will speak fast and move quickly because I, I don't want to be, you know, too much with the time. Mm -hmm. um, this is the Capitol building that I did when I first came to America. It was completely white, of course, but here I reflect the diversity of the country and um, all the different people that come here, including myself, that want to have our, leave our fingerprint and um, this mosaic that represents America. This is the prayer rug for America. Um, here again, between East and West, which is a big part of my message to bring them together. Here you see motifs of Islam, you see the American flag. Um, September 11th was a very divisive time for this country, so I created this painting. You see the little shoes as if you're entering into this, rug, uh, this prayer rug to, to think, not to, not to, to, to be introspective. Mm -hmm. This is changing perception series part, I'm moving fast, a backlash against stereotyping, like the negative reaction. Um, so I did a series of this women. You can see I'm using Lichtenstein here yeah. with the form of Nubaya. Very nice. Here's Mondrian. I am, I'm opening a dialogue. I'm flipping it around, also with a little sense of humor. I, I, you know, I don't want to tell somebody what to think, but I do want to open, 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 open. Here she is with the flag pin. I this see. is the back. Yeah. If I'm moving too fast, no, here, no. okay, here is a large piece, uh, Midnight Prayers, and this was a gift from um, the American people to the Prime Minister of Iraq uh, on his official visit at the White House. You know, here, again, I'm asking for peace in the Middle East. You know, we had the wars in Iraq, we have Afghanistan, um, we have continuing issues in the Middle East, which is such a volatility. Um, and so this is a desire for peace. You could see my colors and patterns. This is the first piece I did when the Arab Spring began. And of course, I used this flower as an idea of hope, of optimism. I decided to, to continue this motif of the flower um, throughout as much as I could of my body of work of the Arab Spring. Um, as, as we know, it became more devastating. Here, this is Avaya driving. We're wishing for hope, equality, different. Oh as, the spring, as the spring goes on, which becomes uglier and uglier and more people are dying and we see that it's not as we hope for. You see my flower, my motif is getting more agonized. I refer here also to Picasso's amazing 
amazing. Guernica, I'm sure, Maria, you're very familiar with that. Very. I, I, I mean... Go to me immediately, Guernica. See. Yeah, exactly. And that painting, that painting was the seminal painting on the cruelty and hideousness of war. In fact, when Colin Powell was going, we were going to an, into Iraq, they covered it up. It was behind him at the United Nations. They covered that painting up because look at how powerful a painting or a photograph can be. You know, it's, it's more powerful than what our voice can do, you know. It reaches some place where uh, politicians cannot, cannot go. It reaches <laughs> into the soul. This is a large triptych. I refer to now the movement of people uh, specifically being displaced from the war in Syria as that continues to progress, regress. This is Women Against the Night. I also hear I'm talking about what you refer to, Maria, as the beauty and the strength of women. Mm -hmm. um, how they stay together against all odds, you know, and I want to portray them as beautiful, dignified, in the color, the pattern. These are inspired by um, embroideries from the Middle East as well. So touching, Helen. It is definitely. It, generations Absolutely. lost. Yeah. Here again, this is a very large piece. Um, in reverse, I'm putting the faces so you can see the faces. Many of my women are from behind because I want to create a sort of universal feeling that you can identify with the painting. Here, I'm, I'm asking you to look and put yourselves in these women. Th this painting goes off the canvas, off my board, because when, when you're in a, in a war situation, even if the bombs have stopped, I, I know this from myself, the effects and the trauma linger. They, they go through generation to generation. I, I seen with my cousins who stayed in Lebanon. I, 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 it, it just, you know, just because the, the, the bomb stopped doesn't mean these issues go. They're holding pictures of their fathers, their sons, their brothers who have been lost. I have a lost. question, Helen. I have a question. Yes, good. Thing. Are these good. ladies reading a manifesto or, or what is that? Is that a piece I, of paper? I love I, I love that question. Actually, not. These are um, these are basically representing. You know, if you will see um, real photographs of women, um, I've seen it a lot in the middle. I've seen it all over. When there's they lose their husbands, their sons, their father, they they'll come to the site and they'll hold a photograph. Oh, right, you see those images. They'll hold a photograph of their lost one, and it's usually a, 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 a male. It's a father, it's a son, it's a brother. So I'm alluding to that here. Mm -hmm. I, they're also faded. They're, they're not, you can't see them actually, um, who they are. Um, and it's also referring to this idea of the endlessness of this cycle, the cycle that continues. I don't know what it is about human beings that continue to not learn from history, but make the same mistakes again, you know? So, and also another way of looking at it is holding a flag of surrender, a white flag of surrender. Look at that, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. A really interesting question. Handkerchief, yeah, like when you, yeah, you give up. Yeah, yeah. White handkerchief, okay. Yeah, a white handkerchief. Um, this is um, referring also to the idea of civilization. These are tiles, ceramic tiles that I painted and also broke, um, referring to the fracturing, referring to the crashing of civilization as they're leaving their beautiful homes. You know, you think of the word refugee. It has a, a strange connotation, you know? I assure you, I assure you that people do not want to leave their home for no reason. They're leaving either because their lives are, you know, no one wants to just leave, you know. So I also want to bring up that idea of dignity and beauty. Their homes, they're civilized, they're doctors, they're lawyers. They're not just people that, oh, for some reason it happens to them, not to us. You know, it's luck. Mm -hmm. It's one word that separates us. It's luck, you know. Here are shoes that I painted, little children's shoes. Um, you know, talking about women and children, they're the most vulnerable. 
And so I refer to them here. I painted little children's shoes on a, on a, a large adhesive photograph. This is an installation. I'm also playing on Dr. Seuss. Oh, the places you'll go. And this book is read to graduating from seniors. From, like you have your dreams ahead of you. The whole world is open to you. But it's not necessarily open to these little children who are crossing borders in, from Syria to Lebanon to Turkey with their families. Their, their worlds are a little bit uh, cut short. They don't have these dreams that we, we, we deserve, that, that people deserve to have, you know? Um, so my reference here is to Dr. Seuss. This is, of course, the, P the migration series based and, and, and inspired by a very famous uh, black artist who is now, he's not with us any longer. He mm -hmm. painted the migration of African Americans after World War I in 1940, 1941, to, from the South in the United mm -hmm. States to the North for better lives. And he has in his painting, Chicago, St. Louis, New York, here you see Turkey, France, Germany, Europe, when they started to try and move and move away. Okay. And I'll just go through these quickly. I wanted to put this one in for you, Donna, um, you, because, Anna. yeah, because this, you know, when the revolution started, when the uprising started in Syria, specifically in March, we just have now uh, marked the 10th uh, anniversary of that, the mark of that. Um, it's interesting that we just are talking about this now, immigration. What agitated as well was a drought, a severe drought in Syria that they were, had been experiencing. So the farmers and the agricultural workers from outside of Damascus, Damascus being the capital of Syria, about a million farmers moved mm -hmm. in around the same time as the revolutions began. There were no work for them. There was no jobs for them. The movement of one million people into the city further, further lit matches to the uh, uh, fire that was already raging from the uprisings. And so this climate change here, what you have, was a, a, a big, big contribution to what we have seen with also, you know, the devastation of, of uh, many parts of Syria. Here, of course, bombing. You see also this use of pattern and color and, and beautiful, uh, strong color. This is Hurriya. I'm moving fast because I want Donna to speak too. Is that this a means free yeah. freedom. It means freedom okay. in Arabic, Hurriya. And you know, I also uh, have a reference to uh, the graffiti that in, especially, specifically in Egypt, in Tahrir Square, they use mm -hmm. so much graffiti to express. But they, the regime came and whitewashed it every day. Oh. And they would come back, the artists would come back and, and keep going back. It was like a cat and mouse game they kept doing. Mm -hmm. So here is referring, um, to the many, many people in prison. It's, that is a horrible story in itself. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Wonderful. This is, yeah, the refusal at the borders um, yeah. to be let in. I'm almost finished. Of course, they, they try and go any way they can go. We, we, we see Lesbos, we see the Mori camp uh, trying to go across the Mediterranean Sea of course, of course, uh, this, we know this. Yeah. Uh, we know this. I decided to keep it in my series, even though it's based on a photograph. But you know, here, like Donna, yeah. I remember yes. this picture. Yeah, right. And, yeah. and you know, people forget because mm -hmm. in this news cycle, we go one, 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 something new happens, something new happens, we forget. So I, I put it, I painted it, it was an exhibition. I had a curator from Germany come and, and I didn't know him, he came, I took him to see the show and he turned around and he had tears in his eyes. I said, oh my God, what's wrong, what's wrong? He said, I forgot about this, I forgot about it. Oof. And it vindicated me, it's like, okay, I, I told him when, the little boy, I talked to him when I was painting, I was crying when I, I said, I'm not forgetting you, I won't forget you. 
And he went back to Germany, the curator. A couple of months later, he sent me an email. He said, you know, we, we, the Germans, I, he said, I thought of you and that painting. They renamed a boat that was going out to rescue the migrants in the sea after this little boy, Aylan Kurdi, who was three or four, found by a Turkish soldier on the beach, dead, with his shoes on. Shoes are also very important. And here we have this piece, um, which refers, you were talking about social movements and the Black Lives Matter movement, which has been raging here and across the world. Everyone has picked this up of, of, of the, you know, talking about the violence against anybody, anybody, anybody. And here, I, there are so many layers in here. I, I went so fast. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I don't want to take, you know, so much time. We can go back to them whenever you want. Helen, we are moved, touched, yes. emotional, yeah. but at the same time it's so beautiful. You know, the way you are presenting it is, is impossible. We are, we are taken away from our chairs, you know, like thinking, my God. But at the same time, you, you present it so elegant, you know, in, in a way that is it's impossible not to pay attention. It's impossible not to, not to be keeping it in our brains. So thank, thank you. you, Helen, it's wonderful to, I think we could talk forever. And I want to go back to the shoes after we present. Sure. Present, um, I want to present um, Donna now because I- Yes, yes, okay, I will, I'll stop sharing. I'll stop sharing now, okay. I was thinking, going back to the presentation that that you did with, with Syria okay, and, yeah, and the yeah. draft, I was thinking it was a good opportunity that now, Donna, um, we make a little presentation about yourself as a climate, um, climate reality re uh, leader, Donna, and being trained by Al Gore and his team. Decided mm -hmm, yeah. to, to, to just to get out there and you couldn't just stay in the Alps where we live. You had to really get further, even more difficult, right? Yes. Well, thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you, Maria, for inviting me. I think that you have, uh, you know, a, a big platform to, to spread word, the word, and this is a, a perfect opportunity. And Helen, I want to say your work is outstanding. And when you present it, it is even more poignant when you can tell the viewer a little bit more about the story. It's really outstanding thank you so much for showing that and for for creating because obviously you know you, what you have inside of you as you said you have to create and that's how you show your message and such an important topic and the way you are presenting it is i i think it can be so beautifully received by the viewer because the message is so important but the visual allows the the viewer to not only understand the message but to also see the beauty in what you've created in the possibilities of hope and i think that's such an important message yeah thank you so much that's yeah thank so you. I really um appreciate it. it means a lot thank you yeah. very, very touching what made you what made you go talking about hope is well this i think yeah hope is, when, hope, <laughs> hope is a big thing in in life right as part of our life and whatever we do whether we're mothers or partners or or activists or climate re climate reality leaders or artists we we always have hope for whatever it is we're all hoping right now that we're going to come out of this covid period in our in our world okay that our loved ones are going to survive this you know so many people have lost their loved ones and so many people are suffering economically and mental health issues are escalating and you know we could go on and talk about this forever but i think i mean i'm an activist and part of that is an inherent um, aspect of my personality but i was also trained as a lawyer and i think that you know the ability to speak out about causes that are important to me are just an inherent part of my being. I have a voice. I know how to use it. I know how to articulate what I want to say. And whenever there's an issue that resonates with me, I feel the need to actually take this out to a larger audience, which I think is a good thing because many of us suffer in silence, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but I just want to, to go back to address what you were talking about, Helen, with the Arab Spring. And I remember I didn't understand the relationship between the adverse effects of climate change and the escalation of what happened in Damascus until I was at my climate reality uh, training, which was in the summer of 2000. 
18, it was in Los Angeles and Al Gore was training for most of the time. It was incredible on the stage, you know, training 2000 of us. And he talked about this. He talked about the displacement of the, the workers and how they, as a result of climate change and the drought and that they had no choice but to leave this land, their land. And that actually escalated what happened. And we're gonna see more and more of that as as, as coastal communities are flooding as a result of climate change, we all know that the ocean levels are rising as, as glaciers in the Arctic and the Antarctic are melting, primarily in Greenland. Greenland's uh, having, the melting of Greenland is having a huge effect on, on coastal communities, uh, water levels rising. And these, the people living in these communities, and I'm in Vancouver right now, so Vancouver is a coastal community, you know, 1.5 million people will soon be displaced within the next hundred years because the water level will be rising up to I think around 10, 15 feet. And this is, when we look at coastal communities around the world, those are millions of people that are gonna be displaced. And that is gonna cause a lot of just, just unsettlement uh, that's, gonna, that's going to increase unstable situations politically in less stable environments and communities. So climate change is a, is a big issue. And I, you know, I mean, I can tell you a little bit about how I started on this narrative because as you know, I was trained as a lawyer and then I moved to Switzerland and was essentially a mother for 15 years. And five years ago, well, actually six years ago, I went to photography school. It's always been my hobby. It's something that I always, I've always been the one with the camera around, you know, my neck taking, taking photos. But it was when I was on a healing walk. Um, my mother had just passed away. My marriage had ended. And I was on this healing journey in the Swiss Alps. And I noticed the palpable effects of climate change visually. And I think that's a big key. You know, we hear about climate change. We hear the numbers. You turn on the news. It becomes overwhelming and people actually turn off. You know, they just don't understand the numbers after a while. Or even if they do, they don't want to hear it because it means they have to do something about it and change their life, which puts people into a state of discomfort. But when you see the images, when you actually are out in the field and you see the effects of climate change, which I see mostly by, by the, the receding glaciers. You know, when you see signposts, like in the Mortarach Glacier in Switzerland, which we're familiar with, Maria, or, or anywhere there's glaciers, many countries have signposts where the glaciers were 100 years ago, 50 years ago, and you're talking about kilometers of um, receding glaciers. And that is a visual perspective that you can't you can't not see that. It's not that you have to analyze some numbers of you know, the parts per million of, of CO2 in the atmosphere and what that means. You actually can see it. So it was on this walk that I, I, I saw you know, some of the adverse effects of climate change and with my camera started documenting this. And then of course, felt compelled to take those messages out to the greater audience. I started speaking in schools in Switzerland. I have a friend that owns a school. I spoke to some of the classes there. I had an opportunity to do a TEDx in Canada. So in preparation for my TEDx, I found out about Al Gore. Al Gore has the Climate Reality Foundation and he trains climate reality leaders annually. And as of today, I think he's trained single-handedly. Well, he has a small team of, of other trainers, but 27,000 people worldwide are trained as climate reality leaders. And one of the requirements is that we go back into our community and we have uh, within a 12 month period, we have 12 causes of actions that we need to fulfill going out into the community, whether it's writing, speaking, activism, lobbying, it doesn't matter what it is. And I've done pretty much, I do something every month I speak, I co-founded a nonprofit in Switzerland uh, two years ago. We had a, an inaugural event where we had exhibitions and speakers, scientists coming and talking about climate change. I had, a, I showed my pictures, I spoke, but I think that the narrative for me with my photos is so effective because it not only, I mean, in the, in the photo that you see behind me right now, that's part of the Rona Glacier, which is in Switzerland, obviously, it feeds into the Rhone River and it's covered with fabric. It's covered, part of the glacier has a cave 
where visitors can go in and see this ice that's thousands of years old. And that's, it's, it's melting at such an exponential rate. Like the, the part that's behind that's dark, that's the, the main part of the glacier. That's melting in height, 10 centimeters a day in the summer in height. And because of the heat of the sun and you can see it's black and what's the reason for that is that the as it melts it creates scarring moraines down the side of the of the hills and the the debris flies off because it's loose the debris flies off in the stormy you know adverse weather and lands on the glacier which covers it with dirt and debris and it becomes dark and is no longer able to reflect the heat of the sun inversely it absorbs it and then it escalates the melting you know so you see this vicious cycle that's going on the part in the foreground that's covered is to protect the, the, the glacier cave from melting so rapidly and it does it it, it prevents it from from melting about 50 percent not not prevents but reduces the melt from about 50 percent which you know it's just a matter of time and there's actually somebody that works there and he you know works regularly recovering it and as the fabric tears and breaks you know he he's there protecting it and it's just this incredible visual of this man who you know has such love for this glacier that that's his job and he so caringly wants to protect it and cover these pieces and that's a visual that you cannot deny, you know, you can hear all the numbers in the world, but when you see something like this, this is super powerful. I've exhibited um, this in, in Canada and I've exhibited it in Switzerland and it's part of a series. And so and I have other pictures that are close ups of it. But when you see this, it's no denying that there's an existence of. Donna, um, can I ask you, what is the cover made of? It's a, it's a, it's, it's a fabric and the exact structure of the fabric, I'm not sure, but it's, it's uh, obviously, you know, it's a thicker, it's, it's almost like a thicker felt and they take it off in the, in the winter months and then put it back in the summer. And it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a strong fibrous fabric, but it does need to be replaced regularly. And the, you know, there's uh, somebody there covering it all through the summer months into the fall. How oh, sad. That is also happening in Switzerland, right? Well, it's happening anywhere there's ice because I'm, um, you know, the, the polar regions are known as the canaries in the coal mine. You might have heard that. And that's, do you even know where that comes from? It comes from, you know, the old mining days, the coal mining days. There was the canary would be the, the trigger to let the workers know that there was going to be uh, a problem and there was going to be uh, some kind of adverse effect in the, in the mine shaft and that they had to get out. So this is kind of a trigger, a warning. And we, the polar regions are our canaries in the coal mine because what's happening, the adverse effects of climate change are felt there first because there's the, the significant bodies of ice are melting so rapidly and the water levels, the ocean levels surrounding are rising and it's measurable. It's not so easy to see when you live in an urban environment, but when ice is melting, it's measurable. So in the Swiss Alps, we have, we have ice, we have glaciers and mm -hmm. they are melting. And there's, a, you know, the, um, the different communities, scientific communities working in Switzerland, the, the WSL, the, um, Val, what is it called in English? The um, forest, land and snow uh, organization is working in Zurich and also in Davos. They have an outpost where they're, constantly working to see what can be done what you know they were talking about covering part of the Mortarach glacier and 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 what can be done in Switzerland you know it's just it's almost not something that you we can it, it's not something we can stop within the borders of our countries you know it's not something that Zurich can or Switzerland can can effectively work towards changing when other countries are not keeping their emissions at the levels that are required under the Paris Accord, the signatories to the Paris Accord, you know, we're already exceeding the 1.5% um, carbon emissions that we've signed on to. It's already around 2%. So we have about 10 years left to get this under control and we have to start moving towards, um, we have to start moving off of the fossil fuel uh, reliance and into clean energy. And this is a discussion that's taking place in, in, in many industrialized countries in the world. But it's 
is it, is it enough? And that's the question. And, you know, there's, there's so many people talking about this at so many different levels. And I bring it in from a completely different aspect because I'm not a scientist, obviously, but I have an ability to bring these pictures into communities uh, for people that might not otherwise see this. I mean, this picture here of the polar bear, that polar, so polar bears, you know, that's another measurable effect of climate change. Polar bears are, are dying. There's about 25, 25,000 polar bears left in the world. And polar bears are having a hard time in the Arctic because they're not able to find enough food as a result of there being lack of ice in the summer months when they need to go out and they need to hunt for their seals. This polar bear right here is feeding on a beached whale that it's in, this was in Svalbard, north of Norway. He's feeding on a beached whale that has been there for two years. And some, you know, for some miraculous way, there's still something for him inside to pull on. He's got a piece of blubber or something in his mouth. And I was with some scientists and photographers and they knew that this whale had been there for two years. And so, you know, they could always go there and, and see that there would be a polar bear feeding on it. And the sad reality is, is that polar bears, okay, you know, feeding on a carcass, but now they're going into bird colonies and they're climbing up into bird colonies on the cliffs and they're trying to get the eggs. And polar bears have been known to swim for a very long time. So as the ice is melting and there's less ice in the summer, they're, they're required to swim for longer and longer periods of time. But the tragic consequences are that their, their cubs cannot swim for hours at a time and they're drowning. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, the devastating effects um, as they're seen in the Arctic and the, and the Antarctic are are palpable and to be able to take this imagery back and show it to people who don't see it, have never had an opportunity to go there. They can see the beauty of the place, but they also, they also can hear the stories and sometimes see the adverse effects. I mean, you don't always see the adverse effects in my, in my photography because sometimes it's just the amazing, beautiful imagery that I show, mm -hmm. but it's, I think it's palpable, you know, and I, I think it's a just, it's obviously an important message to, to convey. And I've decided that through my art and through my photography, this is, this is my life's work. And, and this is, this is the journey that I'm on. I'm, I've just started doing a master's of photography because I, I want to, I, I love to learn. And I think there's always opportunities to learn to uplevel our skills and, and what we're doing and also how to engage and just take that narrative out to the larger public and, and expose it and in, in various different ways. So I have a question, Donna. Yes, Maria. Because these are fragile environments. You, part of the climate reality leader, is photography, because I guess they have different roles within the, the organization, the institution, is your job mainly the, the most important one? Would, would more uh, photographers like to join your organization? Is it when you create the most awareness or you think okay. writers have more power? The Climate Reality um, Foundation trains anybody that, has, that, that wants to take this message out mm -hmm. into the public in any capacity, in any form. So they train, they train scientists, mm -hmm. they train uh, teachers, they train educators, they train artists, they train photographers, anybody that uses, it doesn't matter what the medium is, is as long as it's somebody that's committed to taking the message out and to educating and promoting awareness. And in fact, I don't know many photographers that are, that are climate reality leaders. I know a lot of scientists, I know a lot of teachers, I know a lot of speakers. But if anybody's interested, they just have to go onto the Climate Reality Foundation website and they can see uh, a link for climate reality leaders and there's training annually. For the last year, because of climate change, the, the training has been online, which allows even greater access because a lot of people can't travel to the locations. There's usually one per year in, in Europe and one per year in North America. But it's a wonderful opportunity for people who are interested in these issues and who isn't, right? We are all roommates here in this one planet. We're all living here together. So for somebody not to care about this is something I really can't wrap my head around. But, you know, <laughs> you know the, the more people hear about it, the more, uh, the more awareness we can uh, raise. And, and I think it's really important for people to take, 
take home causes of action, what they can action actionably implement in their own daily life. You know, when I talk to, when I speak to schools and when I did my TEDx, you know, I left the group with three causes of action, five causes of action, what, you know, what you can do at home to, to reduce your carbon footprint, simple things. It's, you know, I mean, there's just so many aspects of it. Did you know that these microfibers, these little mat micro plastic fibers in our, in our sporting gear actually goes into the watersheds and into the oceans is consumed by the fish and then we eat it and we're full of plastic, which is an endocrine disruptor. Okay, all of this stuff, how do you stop that? Well, for one thing, you can reduce washing your outer gear, all of the polyesters that are made from these plastics. We don't need to wash the outer gear as much, but we do need to wash it. So how can we wash it to minimize that? There are filters that you can buy for the washing machine. There's different organizations that sell these filters. They're, you know, you have to pay for it separately, but you can buy them from $50 to $100. You put it onto your machine. It actually helps to filter some of them around 90% of these little microfibers going into the watershed. And, and thirdly, to wash with cold water in a full load that reduces the amount of microfibers going into the watersheds. So, I mean, these are things that people don't know about, right? I, I didn't know about that, you know, a few years ago until I started researching and learning more and more about this. So I think that the best way to do something about it is to learn about it, to empower ourselves and to how we can make changes and then to slowly start implementing these changes. Because if we, if, if it just sounds too overwhelming, nobody will do it. Nobody will do anything if it's too overwhelming. If you tell people don't wash your, don't wash your clothes, they're not going to do that. But if you tell them how they can wash it to minimize the impact, to reduce the amount of microfibers going into the watershed so that we, you know, stop feeding it to the fish so that we stop poisoning ourselves, you know, we know that microfibers in the plastics are endocrine disruptors. That causes cancer. Why are we ingesting all this stuff? You know, we can stop it. And we can, we can really do something to stop all of this. And it doesn't, I don't want to preach, like you said, Helen, I think that that's a really important thing. I don't want to judge. I want to, I want to convey my message in, in a way that makes people want to take responsibility for themselves. I want my pictures to have an impact. Of course, they, of course I do. Um, but I also want people to take ownership. I want them to sort of understand. I mean, I've had a lot of debates and there are a lot of deniers who get very angry and want to fight about it. You know, I'm not going to go there. And I think that for me, when I've, whenever I've encountered somebody who really denies uh, the impact of climate change, it's usually because they have an economic or financial interest invested in something that is contributing to it. So, you know, how do we change this? I mean, how do we, how do we get people that are reliant on fossil fuels for their livelihood, for their industry, to feed their families? How do we get them off of that into new renewable energies? Well, governments are starting to create opportunities. People can re-educate, can be re-educated. There's support and programs that are available. You know, we are changing. It's slow. Some places, some jurisdictions are slower than others, but it is possible. And I think we can also start at home from really simple things. Some people say, oh, what is one person? One person, does, does it make a difference? Well, you know what? One person adds up to two people, adds up to three people. It's an exponential increase. And pretty soon we're at 8 billion people. You know, it, everyone can do their part. But, yeah. but in interrupting you both, I want to ask you, because you say you both have a message and this message turns into into a print which is art both of you one with color one without color but both are so strikingly you know that we are definitely you set a, an emotional tone on where we should be and you create awareness how can art evoke that opportunity to bring to to, to address a conflict and then turn it into beauty why there are not many more artists like you out there doing this because this message is so powerful you know can i that's I, can i say something mm -hmm. um um donna that was uh, amazing i i'm i'm like i learned so much from that um you know maria we need like 50 more hours to talk right yeah like, uh, um but you know something that you said and and maria something that you referred to with my little shoes I think what Donna and I are both doing, whether it's a purposeful, whether it's subversive, like under the table a little bit, is to use beauty to, to 
get our message across. You know, I, I remember I was on a panel with uh, two German photographers from Berlin, amazing photographers. And one of them, I was in an exhibit on this panel, one of the photographers uh, had almost life-size photos of little Syrian uh, kids that had been uh, injured in the war. So they had no eye, they had no arm, they had no leg. They, they were shocking, shocking. And they were huge. Mm -hmm. They were like right in your face. No. And yeah, I could only look at one. I could only look at one and then I couldn't look at it. I just couldn't handle it. And so at the, in the panel, um, he asked the audience, he said, oh, please, if anyone knows where I can exhibit my photographs, please let me know because no one wants to exhibit them. And I thought about that for, I, I thought about that and I thought, yes, well, how is he then going to get his message across that this is happening if no one wants to see them? Whereas with Donna's incredible eye for beauty yes it's beautiful but it's hideous underneath you know i mean the message is so scary as with mine trying to create this beauty so you can see and we can bring you we bring you to our work so you can hear but if you don't if you're not if you don't if you can't see you can't hear yeah you know and but, so uh, it yeah both like for instance the cloth you know the fabric that yeah the, donna is a, 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 you know a big first photographs that put you off because they you know just to see a mountain covered with fabric whether with you helen how many times have we seen a lost shoe on this i know i know i know that shoe and here again is something that donna referred to the numbers are so massive, the destruction, it feels so overwhelming, we, we just want to go back to bed. But you brought up a couple of things, hope and the idea, the concept of bringing it on this intimate level. And Maria, I'm speaking about those shoes. A tiny children's shoe is bringing it down to something intimate, something that you can you can think about. I myself do not have children. I was in an exhibition here in Washington, and the curator was installing my shoes on the rug of former President Woodrow Wilson at the museum here in his house after he left the White House. And she contacted me later. I said, you put the, you put the shoes however you want. And the first pair of shoes she took out from my box were these tiny little kids. And she said, Helen, I, I, I took out those shoes and I began crying because they're the same size of shoe as her little baby girl, Chloe. Mm. She could put herself, her child, she knows that size of shoe. And here I'm talking about this huge issue, which is so large, we, we almost are overwhelmed. We don't know what to do, how we can help. Uh, we, we feel responsible, but we feel guilty. It's all these emotions that are, are so powerful and legitimate. So if we take it in these bite-sized little, little moments, we, we, can, we can try and begin and think about it um, on, on this scale and maybe we can contribute something. Maybe we can um, have that dialogue and open our hearts. Yeah, look, open our eyes, open our hearts. But yeah, I, I, I absolutely I, agree. But don't you think that in the future, all exhibitions should have a purpose? You know, Maria, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I know a lot of artists and photographers who are activists and who have a message. And I know some people working in climate change, in fact, um, and with their photography. And I think I know a lot of artists as well who have social messages. And I I think there's always a message behind the art. And I, I think it's just a matter of, of finding out what that is and investigating a little bit further. There's so much, there's such a, there's so much out there. You know, how do we focus on something? And I find my art by being introduced, I mean, Helen, it's wonderful to be introduced to you here and I'm gonna investigate further and further. Other times we go to exhibitions and we learn about artists, but you know, there's just so many people out there creating. 
But I honestly have to say that in my experience, and I, I've been a, I've been a photography, I've been collecting photography for 30 years, and I've been exposed to the art world for that long as well. Mm-hmm. Going to exhibitions, going to vernissage, you know, meeting with artists. I have hardly met anybody that did not have a very strong message. Yeah. There's usually something that is, it's not an easy life, you know, I mean, yeah to start off and you don't have a lot of clients and you're not making a lot of money and devoting your life to your art is, can be sometimes very lonely, very difficult. And I think that it's really the people who have the strongest messages are the ones that continue on really in my experience from what I see. Donna, somebody's asking what is a cryosphere artist? Oh, oh, the the cryosphere is the world of ice. So it's anywhere in the world where there's ice, it's a, it's a technical term, it's a scientific term for that. So the polar regions, the Alps, um, anything to do with ice. It's interesting, I wrote an article for an ecological magazine last year and that was the, the heading, um, you know, the, the changing nature in the cryosphere. And it's just more of a scientific term. Mm-hmm. You know, but like, it, like Anthropocene, I think it should become, I'm sorry, Helen, yeah, like no, the no. Word Anthropocene, you know, it should become more and more familiar so that people understand what's going on in the cryosphere. It's, it's happening all around the world, the polar regions, the Alps, you know, we're losing the snow in our Alps, not just Switzerland, but all the, all the countries that share the Alps, Austria, Italy, Germany, mm-hmm. France. Yeah, you know, what's interesting about what you said and Maria asked is that the, I, this idea of, of photographing and, and preserving and an artist's voice or message on certain issues. You know, I, I think it's a responsibility that we bear as artists. We are documenting, you are documenting change that you can see right before your eyes. Mm-hmm. And you know, what, what is the point of art? You say you go to museums and galleries and so on and so forth. What, what is the point of art if we don't get learned? Well, I mean, did we learn anything from Guernica? I mean, he painted that in 1935. Yeah. And Jacob Lawrence's, those, the, the Syrian migration, he, ha, he, he painted 60 panels, 30 are in Washington at the Phillips Collection, 30 are in MoMA in New York. His 60th panel that he painted in 1941 said the migrants kept coming. 60, I don't know, 80 years ago is that now? It's like prophetic. Do, are, do we repeat the same or do we learn? Do we learn from the photographs that Donna is telling, or, you know, the fabric covering ice? Who would have thought about that? Mm-hmm. It's like completely crazy. Mm-hmm. But, but do we learn? Is somebody going to come along and learn from, from what we're trying to say? I mean, I think that's, that's the point. We're talking about a period of time and in our world, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's, you know, whatever is our message, the migration, the displacement, war. Um, we're, we're, we're saying, please do not, please learn. Please learn, don't, don't make the same mistakes. Have you both considered making a book? I have a book. You have I a did, book already? It's right no, here. But a, a book with a story. A book with a, uh, and for Helen too. Helen, you could, you, I know you have already a book. Yeah. Book. Oh, you don't see it. You don't see it because of my screen. Can you see that? It's yes, like, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Yeah. Oh. I don't know. I'm, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, no, this, this one, this book, thank you. This book is actually uh, 24 stories. Um, they're true stories that my father told me, us kids. Um, it's the idea of a storyteller. And we're all storytellers here. You're also telling stories too about his youth in Damascus and then uh, Lebanon later and then immigrating finally to America. And so I, I got him to write his stories, his true stories and memories, and I painted them. So it's called Stories My Father Told Me. And it's, um, it's also an antidote to all the negativity out there about the Middle East, because here it just basically shows that we're all the same. We're, you know, we, we, we care about family, we care about our, our village, you know, and, and so that's, that's, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with the Syrian migration, really. You know, it's, it's a different kind of, I, I, I don't have a book of the migration, but maybe inshallah, inshallah that will happen sometime. 
Mm -hmm. And Helen, have you got have you got a sculpture? So will you do three D uh, Arab lady? Yeah. You I have. Well, I have. I didn't show them here. Uh, too many to you. I have installations. Um, the shoes are real shoes that I painted. It's hard to see from that photograph, um, but those are real shoes that I placed on that photograph. It's it's a large installation. There are about twenty four of them, um, and I have other. Um, you know when I'm trying to express, sometimes the, the concept is bigger than two-dimensional. It has to come off, you know, somehow. And so the, the, the canvas isn't big enough to hold what I'm trying to say. Yeah. You know, know. so yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Donna, um, they're asking, um, how, can, how can photography, you know, change into virtual will photography change into film to get more the emotion more connected into the nature meaning um, can photography immerse us into a reality you know because i know that photography you can have it plain on a canvas but mm -hmm. will you consider having um, a filmography of your work well, that's very interesting because I don't do much video and I'm wanting to explore that more. And so I am i was just thinking about this the other day and as I am thinking what my project's gonna be for my master's program, I'm in a two year program. So fortunately I have a bit of time to think about it, but I would like to explore more and more, photo or more, and more videography in my work. And I don't know how that's going to look exactly, but I really enjoy looking at some of the video works that I see in different mm -hmm. exhibitions. So I would like to, I would like to play with that and, and explore that. Up until now, I've only worked with the still photography and use that as my medium. But I think any visual form can be extremely impactful. And anything that brings the viewer in, you know, we're all visual and mm -hmm. anything that brings the viewer in where they can create their own story, their own narrative, or whether, you know, they're, they're given some guidance either by a speaker or by audio. It, it just creates a really beautiful, well-rounded message that people can receive yeah. as opposed to being pounded on the head with yes. data and stats and figures, which are, exactly. are also very important and relative. But yeah. I think this is just easier for the, the masses to consume. Yeah. It's easier yeah. to consume. And once they hear it or once they see it, they're not going to forget it. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I, I yeah. think that's it. It's, it's, in their, it's in their mind. It's in their soul, you know. Exactly. And not everyone's an activist. Not everyone wants to go out and expose themselves right and talk about things that they're passionate about because that's kind of putting your heart on the line and mm -hmm. y you know you can be i mean i i get sometimes a lot of negative feedback and pushback and deniers and you know it you have to have thick skin to deal with something like that i don't i don't have any about. thick skin my skin is not thick at all i wish i had more i have a question for you both on a personal level what is stronger the activist of you or the artist on you? What is Helen, you go first. <laughs> you know, Helen, you know, the it's really, of life. Yeah, it's, it's a really great question. You know, really, I don't consider myself an activist. I don't consider myself political. And, and here, but, you know, it's fine. But, but I, I don't think of myself that way. I think, I think I want to talk about humanity i want to talk about women and children and and you know I, w I will again bring this picasso back into the picture because when he painted that guernica mm -hmm. actually i was speaking in switzerland and i learned about this um, from some reading that i was doing prior to my talk and i learned that when he painted that it was still in his studio and uh, a a a high ranking military official came in because it was creating the stir people were knowing people were talking about it and so this military this is a true story the military official comes into his picasso studio and he sees guernica there and the military official looks at picasso and he said ah so you're the one who did this and picasso said no 
you're the one who did this. Oh my God. <laughs> right? <laughs> Touche, right? Touche. So, <laughs> Touche. Uh, we, we're not, but in, in, in Donna's case, actually, as, as she said, we are causing climate change. We are part of the problem. With, in, in, in these little micro levels that she brought, like washing our clothes, we, we really can do those things. I love that you tell your students and, and people after your talks. I sometimes go away thinking, I've told them all this stuff, now what can they do? I don't have these like things to do. But I mean, I, I think, you know, I, you know I, so I, I just think that as an artist, am I an activist or not an activist? I am responding to what is happening in my environment or what I think is important, and I am expressing it in the only way that I know how, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's fine if, if people want to, you know, but I don't think of myself necessarily that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe an agitator, an agitator. A messenger. Yeah. You are also a messenger. Is, a, messenger. Messenger. a messenger. A messenger. I love that. A messenger. Yeah. I love that. But yeah. Donna is definitely an activist, right? Well, I would like to answer that question uh, because I think, you know, I want to take it a little bit deeper. And, yeah. and what fuels my fire is my passion. Mm -hmm. And in, it, with regard to anything, whether it's my children or my photography or food, but in my photography, I, I'm passionate about the planet. I mean, I, I worked in the Yukon, which is, you know, northern, north of British Columbia in Canada. I worked in, the, in mm. the Yukon for many, many years to finance my education when I was in university. And that was really the introduction of wild, raw nature to me. And that was when I was in my early 20s, because I grew up in an, envir in a, in an urban environment in, in Vancouver. And when I was exposed to this wild, raw nature for the very first time, it opened up something, it just burst open my heart. And I really felt connected. And I really felt that it was my, it's my source. When I need to re-energize myself, mm -hmm. I have to go into nature, you know? And that's just something that I had this lifelong relationship with nature that I think is so vital. And it's, it's uh, for, you know, for anybody, it just go, if you need to recharge and rejuvenate and regenerate, go into nature because that's mm -hmm. our source. That's what, you know, concrete absorbs energy. Nature gives energy, right? It, trees, everything in nature is vibrating in the quantum field with energy. It's all, it's all measurable. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a secret. This is, but you know, Donna, isn't that your motto? nature is my, it's my source. source. Yes. Yeah. So, so back to your question, is it, you know, what is, what is the, the, at the forefront of my work? Is it my activism or is it my photography? It's my passion for nature, which allows me to create because I go into nature and I see this, I think of myself as a conduit that, you know, this is mother nature is the beauty. It's not well, me. Well, you're a messenger, just like, yeah. just like I'm, Maria I'm, said, Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And the more I see, the more I'm compelled to talk about it and take yeah. the message out, which creates yeah. the activism, you know, and yeah. I like to do it. I like to consider it, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a hammer with a velvet glove, so to speak. You know, yeah, I like, me I like, too. I like me to give too. the message in a soft way, but it's, it's yeah. a potent message, you know, right. it's, it's a loaded right. message. Yeah. So I don't know that there can be a, it's not a dichotomy of, is it a photographer or is it the activist? It's mm -hmm. the, the I'm propelled by my passion for yeah. the for nature and that makes me you know one comes from the other yeah mm -hmm. I had a I had a um, I don't know how much time we have but a quick mm -hmm. story about what what Donna and you're both asking is I had a group of young Syrian um, refugees here in my studio and we were sharing stories. I was learning about them and they were learning about me. And there were four boys and four girls. They were about the age of 16. And one boy was very, very quiet. And um, he, he and his family had spent two years living in a tent. I live in Washington, DC. My place isn't big. And we were sitting almost knee to knee, this is pre-COVID, around my living room. And we were, we were almost touching each other. I said, I'm very visual, how big was the tent? He and his 11 members of his family. And he looked at my little small living room, he said, this big, for two years. And then we came down in my studio and, and they were asking questions and we were looking at work and, 
Mm-hmm. And, and, and all of a sudden, as I was talking, I looked over at him and he was crying. Another, another. And I just, I thought, oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. He hadn't said, and, and so I went to him. I just went to him. I put, da- I put down my painting that I was showing. I went to him and I hugged him. And I told him Habibi, which means my love in Arabic. I said, Habibi, yeah. I'm not going to forget you. <clears throat> I, I am going to keep telling your story. I am not going to let the world forget about you. And, and so here, it's like when you were exposed, it's this, that, that, that fuels me. That's, that's, I, I, I don't, it's impossible for, for, for me to, to know that if there's something I could say or do and I'm not doing it, you know, he, he, he makes me keep going, you know, and that's just one incident. I can't save the world, but uh, I, I, I feel like I identify what, what you're saying so much, you know, I mean, it's, it's uh, really interesting that you have both of us here, Maria. We're, we're completely different, but our, what we're trying to do and our message and so on and so forth is so similar. Like, maybe you're my blonde sister from somewhere. I don't know. I think you're both. <laughs> I, think, I think all of us here, you know what, what brought us together? Apart from the energy, of course, because, you know, we, we share interest. I think in, in our inner thoughts. Thanks I think you. what brought us together is that we all have the same goal, which mm-hmm. means you know, to pass a message to the world that there is art out there that is compassionate. And Helen, when we we see your art, we see fear, we see injustice, but then it turns into beauty and dignity that turns into compassionate. Yeah. And then when we see Donna, we see, uh, we see, we're shocked, we see shocked, you know, and worry. Yeah. But at the same time, we see beauty that turns into hope and it turns into compassionate art. So all of us here are for the same. Our, our goal is to find more people like you. I wish we could have talks like this every, every other Friday because that's what we want. We want to pass the message and you made it. That's what brought us together. Yeah, th- thank you so much for inviting yeah, me and, and giving me an opportunity to talk about this and to, to show my work. And Helen, I'm so thrilled to meet you and I'm going to I'm gonna follow you and talk to you and you're, nice, you're nice. in my radar now. <laughs> good, 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 good. I'm so glad. And, I, and I hope we meet personally one day, don't you think? I do too. <laughs> yeah. I do too. No, I, do I, I am pre, in private. I, I asked you many questions. <laughs> and I just oh, yes. writing questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, girl. So thank you so much. Thank you. Any, any last questions? Any last additions? Just thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for your compassion. No, and no, no. It's, it's your work. It's your work that got my attention. No, uh, yeah, but you're our messenger. You're our leader that brought no, us no. together. I, I want to see more of this art out there. I want to go to exhibitions and I am shocked and I am thinking, but I am I, I, moved, I, I, but I, I am think, happy. So we need, we need more artists like you out yeah. there. And you know, I'm happy that the online and the offline community got me together because Donna, I had already met personally, but Helen, oh. we met off online. So but, hey, hey, Maria, Maria, you know, in this, in Switzerland, I very happy because the two temas seem very, very uh, actuality in Switzerland, Syria on the glacier. Yeah. Well, it's very uh, political, it's, it's actuality, it's real. Yeah. Exactly. So it's, it's very, I have feel very lucky for the, <laughs> both oh, temas. Yeah, because you grew and you learned stuff, yeah. Wonderful. It's real. It's real. It's very real. I, I think so many people maybe can show and other and many times. This is true. Yeah. Divided. Um, um, Donna, Thank you are an inspiration to other photographers. You mm. know how, how many how many followers you can have here in Switzerland who really want to have the job you have because everybody likes nature in Switzerland. Mm, and yes. And well, for you, it's a dream job of any photographer. What you did, the expeditions you did, is definitely something that I'm sure everybody has it in the wish list as a photographer. 
right? Well, I, I would invite people to go out into nature and photograph. If people are interested in photography, go out into nature and photograph and create this, develop this relationship with nature and the work will show it and expose the work, show the work. And, you know, everything flows as it should when we're, yeah. when we're in the right direction, when we're going I, where we're supposed to be going. This is another quantum physics thing, you know, the energy from the universe, God, Buddha, whoever the deity is, okay. takes us exactly where we need to be when we're following our path and our destiny. I really believe that. Yes, and for artists, that's right. They should follow their path and their destiny. If, if, you, if, you, if it chose you, you chose it, go with it. It's for a reason, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Helen, we hope we hope one day we can go. Is the the Congress Library open to everybody to see? It is surely it? is. Yep, it yeah. is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you made you it to the White House, you made it to the Congress Library, you made it to the. I mean, how many more museums can there be for you? I don't know. I might, I might as well just finish now. I'm finished. I've achieved everything I need to achieve. But you both made it know, one way or the other. You are with with really the biggest institution in the world. So what else is there for you to do, girls? There are other things. <laughs> there are other things. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you so you. much for the opportunity you gave us. Thank you. Thank, and thank you for following us in our in this dream of ours that you know we think it, showcasing. Talent is the most important yeah. talent, but a purpose, we want purpose in the message and you made it happen today. So thank, thank you. you everybody. And thank you. Let's continue. Uh, yes. Online and offline. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. 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 bye.